All right, we are live streaming and we are recording. All right, perfect, great. Well, this is Mayor Gailey and we're gonna start a city council workshop. Uh, it is Tuesday, October 20th, 2020 and it's 7 p.m. And this again will be a workshop. And um, with that, I think we'll just go right into the agenda, which is starting out with the Lake Stevens Road Club. Eric. Eric, you're, you're, uh, you gotta unmute. Eric, Eric, I assume you would like me to share the presentation? You're muted, I can't hear you. Yes, that would be great, Kelly. Okay, I've got it ready to go here, hold on. Well, good evening, Mayor, City Council, members of the public. Uh, this is just a quick brief update on our discussions with the Lake Stevens Rowing Club uh, we've met with them a couple times to discuss their needs, talk about uh, potential building on the new Festival Street, Mill Spur, uh, and then Lot uh, 11, I believe, over off 18th, 17th place. Uh, I, I had met with them over there. We toured the house, toured the property. Uh, one idea was that they may want to save the house, but once they took a look at it, Obviously, that wasn't going to work for them. Uh, they're very, very interested in the property. Uh, maybe you can advance to the next page, Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, in all these discussions, we talked about if they were on Mill Spur, the Festival Street, what the benefits could be and what the concerns would be. They just really didn't have enough space. Uh, you know, they've got 50 to 60 foot long crew boats to get them out into the middle of the street there, or even out the back, they'd have parking lots and boats to contend with and negotiating around all that. Uh, you know, while it may work in the short term for them, they're really looking at a, uh, wanting to be a world class organization here in Lake Stevens. So they're, they're looking very, very long term. They have lots of plans to move forward with fundraising. So maybe the next slide, Kelly. Uh, so we actually, like I said, toured the lot 11 that the city bought. Uh, they're very, very interested in it. Uh, I think their goal at this point would be to move uh, remove the structure there, which the city had planned to do already. We've already done asbestos testing and, and have a plan for demo and abatement. Uh, level the lot, pave the apron out front. Uh, they could either do a gravel or a concrete pad. They'd like to see a concrete pad. Uh, we do need to get a survey of the property because the corners and the wetland delineation isn't clearly marked at this time. Uh, to see exactly what the setbacks and the limitations would be. Uh, the rowing club would uh, like to see the city help move the existing boathouse over onto that lot along the west property line with the five foot setback. Uh, we have been talking with the neighbor to the west and we talked about putting up a, a six foot cedar fence or something to provide them some privacy. Uh, the row club obviously would do any upgrades and additions, uh, you know, electrical, there is a water service that comes with the lot, there's a sewer hookup, but they, they feel this is actually a really good space, it's closer to the boat launch than they are now, uh, it would provide them adequate space, they would have water sewer available, and with a possibility to expand, I know there's some discussions on possibly purchasing the other lot. They do understand that uh, they would have to sign a new lease with the city that probably wouldn't be as, as uh, reasonable as it is today. We talked about some market values and, and doing a little more research to figure out what that would look like. So Kelly, maybe the next slide. Okay. Uh, their long range plan is kind of outlined here They'd like to do some additions on, onto the building, maybe lift it up so they can store more shelves, maybe do an addition for some more workout space. Uh, and they, they feel as downtown grows that it would still be pretty decent spot to have a storefront to sell their wares, you know, shirts and different 
things uh, out of that location as things build out downtown. Uh, so those are their upgrades that they would think in the in the near to far term. Maybe the next slide I think has a a layout. So excuse me, it's lot twelve. It's a lot eleven that we are. You guys had discussions, I guess, in executive session about purchasing. So it's lot twelve that the city owns. You can see you got the canal in the back and there's a wetland buffer that cuts through there. So we do need to find out just how much usable space there is there. Maybe next slide. So that was kind of the layout that we had worked out with them that we thought might work. Obviously the to the north is, is 17th and, and the boat launch. Try and push that boathouse building that's 20 by 80 back as far as we can to the east to give them room out front to be able to set up their boats without you know getting out in the lane of traffic. Uh, there's a couple additions there that they talked about for additional storage and, and a workout room. Uh, they really like the lot so I, I think that's their first choice versus being on on the festival street which really doesn't work for them and I can understand why. Maybe the next page. So they, this is their proposal that they put together of what they'd like to see the city do. Uh, the city obviously hasn't committed to anything at this point other than to work with them in a good faith effort to get something that works out well for the city and, and the road club in the near term and the far term. Uh, so they, they put this together that we, Obviously, we bought the property, we demolished the house, moved the, moved the current boat house over. We kind of have a plan to do that, aid them with permits and, and do the asphalt work and a cement pad under the boat house. That's what they would like to see the city do. Uh, they would then do the you know, electrical service and hookups, take care of their own heat, uh, take care of the water and any additional, you know, I guess, aesthetic work that they would do with paint and building additional racking and those kind of things and signing a new lease with the city. Uh, have no idea what that would be, but that's something that we'd have to work out. I know Gene mentioned doing a little more market research to see what the other road club cascade at the other side of the lake was paying. Uh, not necessarily apples to apples because they paid to build the building there. so. You know what does that look like? I I don't know. I can't answer the the money part right now today. But we are looking at at that. Uh, is was there another slide, Kelly? This is, yeah, this is your last slide. The next steps. Yeah. So the next step, uh, we're already working on doing doing the survey uh, to see just how much usable property there is there. Uh, Obviously, like I mentioned, we're, we've already done asbestos testing and, and uh, do have plans and a budget to demolish the house. We're hoping to do that this year yet, probably towards the end of the year. Uh, and then they'd have to figure out their own internal cost of the upgrades that they need to do. Uh, and also on their end was figuring out what events they have going just so we can make this move. Uh, I think they said after their spring regatta and before June 1st. So that kind of works with the city's time frame and what I've got going. Uh, and obviously to agree on, on the money aspect of, of who does what and then at the actual lease agreement. So uh, we have had some movement with them. They're a great group to work with. They've been very amenable to uh, moving and doing something different. Uh, I think Gene shared an email with you know a future building of what they would like to see in the future if they could do some fundraising. Uh, right now to, to do that type of facility, their membership would pretty much have to double. I think they said they had like 30 kids now and, and uh, in the youth program and 20 or so adults and they'd have to be up in the 100 total member range to be able to afford a structure like that, but they're thinking, you know, the more exposure they can get, the more outreach and education they can do with moving their facility and making it a little nicer 
and uh, using some of their funding that they have for a marketing strategy to help bring in membership uh, was kind of where they were at. So I think that's about it. If anybody has any questions, I can do my best to, to answer. <clears throat> Eric, um, when we purchased the property, did we not do some sort of environmental assessment as to where the wetland boundary is? We did not. Okay. So in all likelihood, just my knowledge of the property, I'd be very suspect, I guess, uh, to think that the plot plan that they have laid out 60 feet, 80 foot for a boat and another 160 feet off the street there. It's probably not likely. I, I would agree. And we talked to him about that, what we could do to shrink that, which is why our first step would be to get the wetland delineated in a survey. Uh, they said they could go down to 40 feet and then just as long as they could get those longer boats either out the front or the back and then along the side, which would be their yeah so i guess get them along what, the side what it's leading to i guess is discussion about what's plan c <laughs> assuming the wetland only allows for a, a 75 foot building footprint um or less you know what what is another option i guess to explore okay i and, i don't know that we have a Plan C, Councilmember Peter Shagan, just yet. Uh, I think we need to do a little more research on this wetland issue and and uh, kind of Does, see if, if we can still fit in there. I don't know that we have another good option for them. Uh, the brown we, house, the brown house that's behind uh, the boat shed right now, that stays with Millspur Lane going in, right? It it does not. It does not. Okay. Mm -mm. Is there any possibility of use, utilizing any of that on a short-term basis? Well, what, what we've done is we've done a, a conceptual boundary line adjustment there to create an individual lot for the Grimm House and an individual lot for the museum that was, you know, Gene had presented a museum slash boathouse joint facility. If, if that didn't work, that would give us more commercial space to market, but by the time you get a buildable lot with the front setback, you're pretty well out into that whole brown house lot there to okay. get everything on the corner. You okay. know, Mill, Mill Spur is a, a fairly wide street with, with wide sidewalks on both sides. So okay. once you get the, the setbacks in there, it doesn't leave a lot of usable space, which was the boathouse or the rowing club's concern that if they did come out the back, they'd be offloading right into the existing parking lot, right? And you know how busy that gets during fishing and boating season. That'd be a nightmare to try and negotiate a crew boat through there. Uh, so the, the other lot that we've contemplated purchasing is lot, what number? 11. 11 then, yeah. And those lots are what, 50, 40, 50 feet wide? Uh, I don't, can you go back to the plot map, Kelly? Yeah. 50 feet wide, I guess. 50 feet, okay. So would there be a possibility of putting something on there in an angular type uh, combination, the two lots? Yeah, I mean, they would love to see us buy that other lot and, and share that with them. Uh, they, they were thinking super long term that if they could get the funds that, that we'd have both lots, they would have their temporary structure here on lot 12 and then they would build this world-class facility that Gene kind of sent you guys pictures of on lot 11 and then they could could demo their stuff on lot 12 and they'd have combined both lots to use but you know what we brought up with them geez the city is going to have a million dollars into these these two lots at the end of the day and that's a lot just to give them practically for nothing you know and so it, Jim right. was having the discussion with them. Well, would you be interested in purchasing them or, you know, and, and they're open to all options, uh, you know, a long-term lease with a purchase attached or, 
you know, so they, they really would like to see us buy lot 11 for sure. So they'd have more space. I think that's their ultimate long range goal. Is there an opportunity to maybe do an exterior structure with like uh, putting fencing up to where maybe they could lock, lock it up. And then maybe it's not indoor. I, I, I'm sure indoor is way better than outdoor, but something that is an outdoor structure that they could lock up in fencing and then put additional spots outside, whether it's covered or some type of covered, to where they could do that if if what you're seeing and what I what I'm think I'm hearing is, hey, maybe the lot doesn't let them have a long enough building for more space, but maybe they can do an outdoor structure to put more shells out there and do an exterior structure with some kind of cover over it to protect it and then lock it up because we know we don't want anyone messing with it. I'm just, is that a possibility too? I, I don't know. They really need that length, Marcus. And if you've looked in the building that they have now, they've got, you know, they work on these things, toolboxes in there and they refurbish and they're doing, you know, a lot of work on these things and they set up all their exercise equipment. So uh, I, I don't think they really want any of these nice crew boats that they have out outside exposed to the weather but uh, well i was thinking something maybe with a roof on top of it or some type of canvas i don't know i'm just trying to think of alternatives ways to help make it work i don't know as much route rowing near as much as you gary or yeah i think part of the problem marcus is the during the winter october through about march they spend more time indoors conditioning than they do on the water so gotcha. that's the reason for it in close facility is they have ergs inside and, and they spend more time uh, land workouts than they do on the water. So I know there's an alternative that is a, that if they want room for more shells and they need more room inside, I was just thinking maybe being able to store some of the shells outside. I, I don't know enough about mm -hmm. it. You're talking just try to think of alternatives. That's all. Well, I think I would propose moving forward with, you know, either way, the city's going to need to do the survey to know our boundaries and, and what we have there. So I guess I would would uh, recommend moving forward. Let me get the survey, work with Russ to get the wetland boundaries staked, see what the setbacks are. Again, these are temporary. That's considered a temporary structure. So I don't know, Russ, if the setbacks would be reduced a little bit because it is a, you know, portable metal building. Uh, these are some of the questions that I think we need to, to figure out, see just what we can fit in there. Uh, then it's ultimately council's decision on the lease and, and what we want to do if we purchase the other lot and if we want to make that available. You know, we, we talked about additional parking for the, for the boat launch, but uh, that's pretty narrow regardless. If you think about a standard pickup and a 16, 20 foot boat, you're 40 feet, you know, a standard boat and trailer. So to get onto one of those lots and be able to park a boat in a trailer is probably not very realistic. So mm -hmm. both lots would be super useful for, you know, even down the road or something. If you had both, then you could get some additional boat parking in there. But, you know, in, in 50 feet, that's dang near the length of a crew cab pickup and a 20 foot boat, you know, you're 40 feet. Uh, so both lots would be nice. And I think council's entertaining that because a 50 foot wide lot is, is very narrow. Uh, mm -hmm. You couldn't even get parking on either side with an adequate drive aisle down that, you know? Yep. Council member Daughtry. I'm kind of wondering about the ROI on putting a world-class facility in there on both lots. Uh, if we, if you look at the ROI for the community, not for the city government, but for the community, how many regattas could they do with a world world class facility? Uh, what is Fish and Game going to let us do? Because every time we have a regatta, we're closing down the the boat launch, and I think we're limited to either two or three a year. Uh, we usually do more than that, but they they just kind of look the other way. I don't know what that would do. Uh, if you're going to have six or seven regattas in a summer uh, you know, at a world-class facility, I think that the ROI to the community would be pretty high. Um, hey. So I kind of want to, you know, kind of look at that too. If you've got both lots and you can utilize that and build that world-class facility, I think it'd be a great thing. But 
it depends on what we think is really going to happen. Yeah. I the think use, the only the time we actually it. closed the boat launch, Kim, is is for Aquafest, right? I remember no. the boat launch stayed open during the regattas. Uh, they close it for a few hours for the regatta. They close it, well, we used to close it for Iron Man. That's not there anymore. Uh, Aquafest is certainly closed, and it's closed for five days, I think, five yeah. days. Um, I do know that two years ago or three years ago, we got pushed back from uh, Fish and Game. Uh, they almost they almost said something about not having Aquafest anymore at one point. So uh, Jill was involved, I think, in that conversation. But, uh, you know, that's one of those things, I think, that because we, we know that there's a little bit of a push point there with fishermen, et cetera, et cetera, when we're doing things downtown, no matter what it is, if we close Main Street, you know, that makes the fishermen go around and they, they get upset about that. We, we kind of need to know from the row club you know, what would that look like if you had this world-class facility where we're doing more regattas or is that the plan or you're just going to have two a year or what is it? And then we're looking at an ROI for the community on that. Uh, that's where I think it goes. And then, okay, can we really afford to drop a million dollars in the city to make this world-class, help them make this world-class facility with whatever the ROI we think it is? And that's only if after we've done the due diligence on the site. So, I think that's a fair question to, to ask them, Council Member Daughtry, of, you know, just what would that look like on the site? I, I mean, how many events a year uh, would you require closures? And, and definitely my contact at Fish and Game, you know, from when we did the last project, uh, they, they do have some concerns for fishermen. Uh, and, and make sure that we float that by all the stakeholders for sure. Any other questions, concerns? All right. Well, it's a lot to think about on that one. But, uh... We'll have to get that wetland study, figure out what our boundaries are. Thanks, Eric, for working that. I um, got muted. I got muted somehow on that. I did have one more comment. Okay, Jim. I actually hit my little button. Sorry. Um, the other thing about the regatta is if we have larger regattas than we had, we have to think about dock space. Uh, we do have the temporary docks that we can put in for them, but I don't know if that's enough for a large regatta. All right. Okay, let's move to the next uh, subject, which is letter supporting the adoption of a 0.1% sales tax for affordable housing. Housing, Angie, you're up. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mayor and Council and City staff. I want to um, especially thank Russ for preparing the staff report um, that summarizes the ask. There's a lot of information in front of you tonight. Um, I know that there were questions following the initial rollout of this information at last week's meeting. And so um, I talked over the weekend with Kim. He had a uh, and an older PowerPoint that he was willing to bring out and dust off a little bit. He's going to share some of the information from that. Um, but the, the, the conversation tonight is in regards to a letter of support that the Alliance for Housing Affordability has drafted and is asking for the participating municipalities on that alliance to, um, to endorse and send to the county council showing our support for the passage of this one tenth of 1% sales tax increase. Um, there's um, information in the, in the, the PowerPoint that I'll go over towards the end and then just really wanna open it up for questions. Um, like I said, there's a lot of information that can get a little, a little in the weeds. And so I'm happy to provide whatever clarification I can. And in the hopes that folks feel comfortable um, moving forward with uh, showing our support. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kim so that he can go through his numbers first. Okay, so thank you very much, Angie. Uh, like Angie said, we worked on this Sunday for quite a while. I started on it a while back uh, when we first started uh, talking about affordable housing and, and talking to a couple of uh, citizens, uh, trying to answer questions, et cetera. That, that's why I came up with this because there is some 
um, misconceptions or differences of opinion on definitions that we're using uh, around the affordable housing subject. So just to share a few things with you on this, I'm gonna bring this full screen so it's easier to see. Affordable housing is defined as housing costing no more than 30%, oops, sorry, 30% of, what the heck is going on? Try this again. There's a transition in play. Yeah, really. It's defined as housing costing no more than 30% of a family's income to pay rent or mortgage. Now, what that means is any family's income. It doesn't mean that there's a, a, the mean income of the area. It doesn't, it doesn't mean any of that. What it means is if they pay more than 30% of their income, then they are cost or rent burdened. Mortgage lenders use anywhere from 26 to 36% in their mortgage calculations, but that's based on the many risk factors to the lender that they take into account. And I have it on good authority that uh, most of them will only go up to about 32%. Um, the next slide is that one. How am I gonna go to full screen again now that I can see my full screen? Um, so now let's talk about the area median income. Now, the first thing I wanna say about this as you're reading it is that the area, median income from, I have four or five sources for this and they're all different. Um, and between the four sources that I could share with you and where they came from and everything, there's a 7% disparity. So I'm gonna use the one that's kind of in the middle. It's from Data USA. And it says the median income for Snohomish County was 87,440 in 2018, which is a 5.87% increase over 2017. Now, if you were to just put into your Googleator machine and said, what is the median income for Lake Stevens or Snohomish County, I mean, that's what you'll come up with at the first thing that comes up on Google. The mean average home price, just as a, just as a comparison, the mean, the mean average home price for December 2018 was $360,000. HUD, on the other hand, shows that the average mean income for 2020 uh, is 108,600, or 2019, I'm sorry, which would be a 24.2 increase over 2018. I find this number to be a little suspect because I can't find it anywhere else other than a HUD um, chart that Angie shared with me that we'll see in a little while. So by definition, a family that has an income at the 2018 AMI could afford $2,186 per month for housing costs. And for the HUD number, they could afford 2715 per month. Now, that's at the AMI. If you're below AMI, obviously you can afford less. So the, for further reference, the mean average sales price for a home in East Snohomish County was 399,000 in December of 2018 and 40, 465,000 in September of 2020, which is a 16 and a half percent increase in 21 months. So basing, using the examples from, from 2018, if you were at an 80% of the average or the, uh, yeah, the average mean income, you could afford $1,748 and not be cost burdened. For 50% of AMI, you'd be making about 43,700 and you could, you could have housing costs of 1,093. And for a family with an income of 30% of AMI, which is just a little bit below what $15 an hour is, you could afford $655 in housing costs. I interject With, quick into the slide. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I think another way to look at that slide too is that if, a, if one of those families were moving into an affordable housing program, that is roughly what their rent would be calculated for their unit. Right. And this is the chart that Angie shared with me from HUD, which is where the 108,600 came from up here in Snohomish County. So this is how they look at it on what you can afford. One of those, one of those things that they look at, it's one of many things they look at, I found out, but this is one of those things that, that you would see on how they would go for it by rent limits, by a target population based on AMI, et cetera. So now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because 
people look at affordable housing as low income housing and, and they kind of interchange those two. That's not the case. The case is that there's an affordable housing is 30% of your income, no matter what that income is. And low income housing is something totally different. Uh, affordable housing can fall into and sometimes, most times do, does some, no, sometimes does fall into a low income. In Lake Stevens, we have nine affordable apartment properties, affordable apartment properties, 164 low income apartments, and 293 total housing units with rental assistance, which is Section 8 or there's two other, two or three other uh, rental assistance programs. That just gives you an idea of what's already in Lake Stevens. Uh, I believe the rest of this is for Angie. I guess before we move forward, do we want to stop? Are there any questions so far? Okay, we'll dive yeah, in. I oh. was going to, I'm sorry. <clears throat> now do I remember my question? No, I don't. It'll come back to me later. Sorry, Angie. No worries. It'll, it'll come back to me. Sure. So I'm not going to read the this whole thing. I wanted to point out a few pieces about um, House Bill 1590. That one of the issues that, um, or one of the the main points, is that this is a um, this grants councilmanic authority to the county council. And so the last increase of one tenth of one percent um, to our sales tax was voted on by the county and passed. This tax increase can be made um, by the county council without a vote of our community. Should this pass, uh, there are provisions as to how these dollars can be spent. 60% uh, of the dollars must be used for um, construction of affordable housing, constructing mental and behavioral health related facilities, funding the operation and maintenance costs of un new units of affordable housing, um, or newly constructed evaluation and treatment centers. There's additional language regarding the target, target population of the housing related service programs. And so I, I wanted to point that out because it's the, the target populations are specific to housing related services and not necessarily related to the construction of affordable housing. And there was some confusion around that. So I wanted to sort of delineate between, um, between how those, pot, those sort of categories of people that that is specific to the housing related service programs. The remaining 40% of the dollars collected uh, must be used for operation delivery or evaluation of mental and behavioral health treatment programs and services or housing related services. You can look at the next slide. Um, so the uh, county currently has, um, they, like I mentioned, they had passed a one tenth of 1% sales tax increased in 2009. And those dollars are used to fund behavioral health related programs. It's likely that the, um, that these dollars would be sort of, there would be oversight similar to that fund that's currently collected um, through possibly the human services department, our office of um, housing and homelessness, but also through a, a citizens advisory board that helps determine how those dollars are spent. And I just provided some additional information just so you can see um, what's already happening in our county and how that might, um, how that information helps us understand how these dollars might be used. So in 2019, the revenue from the um, mental health sales tax was 17,667,466. That fund has increased about a million dollars every year since it was passed in 2009. Um, the difference with mental health funding is that housing funding, the, um, the, the, kind of conservative estimates are that local dollars leverage state, federal, and philanthrop philanthropic dollars for housing development. And so if conservatively that fund brought in 15 million, um, the likelihood is that it could result in an additional 80 million in additional funds from outside of our county. Uh, and so the um, both the HART, the Housing Affordability Regional Task Force, and the Alliance for Affordable Housing are recommending the passage of House Bill 1590 and that the council pass this, the county council, um, to allow for a revenue stream for affordable housing in Snohomish County. 
So I um, increased some information that, that was discussed at the Alliance for Housing Affordability um, meeting, our last monthly meeting or quarterly meeting, excuse me, about why this is our role and why this is city's role. The goal really is to have every city um, that's a part of the Alliance, the AHA, um, be willing to sign off on this letter to show the County Council that all cities support the passage of this um, increase in sales tax. Part of that reason is because if the county chooses not to, cities then have the opportunity to consider passing this for their own individual cities. Um, in conversations in this, in this um, alliance, there are some real negative aspects to having all 20 cities pass 1590 for the specific city revenue divvying up those dollars 20 different ways in our county and losing the opportunity for leverage of those other dollars. We can look at the last slide. Um, and these are just sort of uh, other, other points that have been brought up both by the Alliance and by the Heart. Um, reasons why it's important for cities to speak up and voice our support to our county council, uh, voice our, our opinion to, this, to the county council and let them know um, as a city why we do or don't support moving forward with uh, passing 1590 in our county. So I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna open it up and work to answer any questions that you might have. I remembered my question. I, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to Angie and Kim for all the research and helping us to understand this more. Uh, when I doorbelled in Lake Stevens, I found people who said to me uh, that they can't afford to stay here. So um, I went to the AHA meeting with Angie so many moons ago. Uh, and uh, I remember saying to them, if we build it, meaning affordable housing, they will stay. This does impact Lake Stevens citizens, but also I really like the idea of us sending this to the county and it just will simplify it so much greater because wherever the, the people are that need this support uh, can find it. Uh, and I know, I don't know about you, but I have friends that are potentially homeless and I know seniors that are struggling. In fact, many of the people that spoke to me at their door who said they can't afford to live here anymore, we're seniors. So uh, this is, this is uh, our neighbors, this is our citizens. But I, I, I really approve of this uh, hard work that you've both done, thank you. So one of the things I think has to be talked about on this is um, you send all this money in a big kitty to the council uh, this county council and, and they have some kind of an organization that takes that money, it leverages it and builds affordable housing. The big question is where is that affordable housing built? Mm -hmm. And there is really no way of understanding where it's going to be done. Uh, there's so many different variables about that. Uh, one of the things that Lake Stevens could possibly do to leverage some of that in Lake Stevens for our citizens is to uh, figure out how we can come up with other incentives to have builders looking at what properties available here in Lake Stevens to do that at. However, the general consensus at uh, Snohomish County tomorrow is that the low or the affordable housing and low income housing would be built around the I-5 spine where we have the transit available, uh, which would make more sense for either the low count, you know, the lower affordability housing to go into because then they have transit available to get to their jobs. In one way it makes sense, but in the other ways it doesn't help Lake Stevens if that's all that happens. So I think that when we actually go to, if we actually pass this and we have that money leverage and we start talking about that, we are at the table about where it goes and how, can, and how does Lake Stevens reap some of those benefits of that to our citizens. I'm not sure it's there. I, we don't have that much buildable land left. I mean, there's some places we could tear down and rebuild, but that's even more expensive. So there's all those questions are still there. I'm not really sure that if, it, if you ask the question, how does this benefit Lake Stevens? I don't think that can be answered. I think it benefits the region and that's what it's all about. I think, you know, we have a few low income housing developers, I'm sorry, affordable housing developers that are um, sort of central to Snohomish County and they're a part of the um, 
uh, oh, I'm totally blanking on the name, Everett and Snohomish County Housing Consortium, and which is a, a group of um, folks who are sort of tasked with uh, moving affordable housing through the funding pipeline and, and but also researching location and um, you know where the where the greatest need is, what makes sense in terms of affordable housing, where it's located in the county, um, close to transit, close to employment, that sort of thing. And and so I think one of the good things about collecting these dollars centrally at the county level is that collaboration with the housing consortium and those developers who have already put in tons of work and research to really look at where the best, you know, where the best placement is. I agree though, Kim, I don't know that you can then take that information and determine um, how, how does that benefit the city of Lake Stevens per se. I think it is a, it's a community-wide effort and issue. So the other side of this coin that we need to talk about, I'm sure is going to actually come up is you're talking about a tax increase during these unprecedented times. Sorry, I had to say that. Um, there are some people that are already in extremis and then putting another $20 a year onto their taxes is probably not the right thing to do. There's some seniors that are concerned about that. Uh, so there are other low income individuals that would be concerned about that because, you know, it's, yeah, it's just $20, but you're adding it to the other things that are just $20 or just $100 or just whatever on their property tax and that kind of stuff. So that I just want to make sure that that's on the table also. I, I did not make this presentation or enter into this presentation with Angie with any kind of, a, a, yeah, I'm going for this point or one-tenth of one uh, one percent. I, it wasn't meant for me to say I'm for this. I, was, I just wanted to get information out so we can make, as a, as a council, make a good decision on whether we're going to send this letter to the council the county council with our endorsement or not. So I just don't want, I want everybody to know that I have not endorsed this yet. I still have to be convinced. I'd like to address the point you bring up about um, individuals and families being burdened by the increase in sales tax. And um, absolutely agree that if, you know, if you could pick, pick the best time to raise the sales tax countywide, this is not the best time. And because of that, I think it's imperative that we, prepare for the fact that we are going to have significantly more individuals and families in need of affordable housing options. I think we have yet to find out the impact of, you know, the COVID-19 and the economy and what that might mean for Snohomish County moving forward and for Washington State moving forward. And frankly, we don't have a dedicated fund today in Snohomish County to develop the level of affordable housing that's needed today. And the concern is that that need is only gonna grow over the next 12 to 18 months. And if we don't do it now, then 18 months from now, we're gonna be that much further behind in assisting those individuals and families that are in need. Thank you, Angie and Kim for spending time on this. It is an important issue, um, but a couple of thoughts come to mind. Um, you indicated 17, 18 million dollars were collected in 2017 or 18. 2019. 2019 for the mental health portion of which about 40% of this new tax would go towards that again, right? They would go towards the construction of facilities. So the current dollars collected, the current one tenth of 1% 1 sales tax fund um, is primarily spent towards programs and services. The sixty percent is spent there. Forty percent is basically your overhead, your program management, your uh, looking at other. Uh, uh, what? How they say that? <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. You're Kim. talking about the current. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess the issue of, you know, getting units built is the is the underlying theme here, and. Um, you know, there's only about 60% of that fund being generated that actually gets uh, two by fours up in the air. And so that is a concern. Uh, and the other concern I have is 
and hopefully you can answer this, but, um, you know, when taxes get raised and so forth, they never seem to go backwards. And it's this layering on effect that once a tax is in place, um, you know, I would venture to say in five to 10 years from now, there'll probably be a push to increase this portion again. Um, and so the question would be, is this a tax in perpetuity or is there a sunset date to this proposal? It's a great question. Um, there is no sunset date. It is a tax in perpetuity. The legislation caps the amount at one tenth of 1%. So it can never be raised, um, but it, there is no sunset on the amount. It can be raised by the legislature though, oh, because okay. they authorized it in the first place. Okay. <laughs> so um, going back to your, your first point though, about the 60%, the minimum amount for capital um, building is 60%. So the, the, um, the county council or the advisory board, um, depending on the need and, and those decisions that are made could very well decide, um, know that what's more important in our community after we assess the needs is that we really need, you know, 70 or 80% towards capital because we have such a shortage of affordable housing. So I just want to make sure that this, the, the understanding is the 60% is the the least amount that could be used towards capital. All right, appreciate that. Yeah. So my main concern is a tax in perpetuity. Uh, I would only support this if there were a sunset date on that of say five or 10 years. So it'd be reevaluated, rejustified, and show the importance in the accomplishments that have taken place. The other thing I guess I would say, I, I find it ironic that um, and being a private developer, uh, government is not the most efficient uh, developer out there of housing units. <laughs> um, you know, we get into the world of growth management, things of that sort. And so the very entity that is, is uh, sponsoring affordable housing is the entity that stands in the way of affordable housing on the private sector. So that is a extremely ironic, um, scenario that I scratch my head over, over and over again. Uh, we can't expand urban growth boundaries. We talk about, as Mr. Daughtry talked about, uh, available land supply, yet we're supposed to go up and not out. And um, now we have a need for affordable housing because of all this. So just, it's a perplexing situation that we have, but again, Bottom line is I would only support this if, if there were a sunset date to this um, legislation. I, the affordable housing that I am um, aware of and have been involved with in Snohomish County has been developed um, by developers under contract by nonprofit organizations. So the typical, um, right. it's not typical for government, I would say, to develop um, affordable housing. I would agree that I don't know that that's, uh, that's necessarily in their wheelhouse, but uh, is, that, is, that, is that clarified in this though? It's not, but um, the Stomish County Office of Housing and Homelessness and Community Development receives several million dollars a year in federal funds that is used for um, low income housing development. And all of those dollars are, um, are contracted out through an RFP process to nonprofit agencies within our county and housing is developed through that partnership. But we're talking affordable housing, not low income housing. Sorry, I, 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 I interchanged those comment shouldn't affordable housing and low income housing our office of homelessness typically only develops um, low income housing but it all falls under the affordable housing umbrella okay and i just as a commentary I, you know we have some great partners in this county housing hope cocoon house um you know everett housing authority things or i guess it's now snohomish county housing authority you know we have great entities that are doing the the mission i guess or the the work uh, that is needed. And um, I guess through this process, is, are the dollars to be focused towards those type of entities or Absolutely. is this a new bureaucracy that's being created? 
Nope. It's really, it's, it's, it's to help support those entities that are already doing really great work at Sonomish County. You're right. We have amazing um, affordable housing partners in this County. It's to develop a funding stream so that they can actually continue doing what they're doing and meet the need that exists. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for all your work on it. It's um, outside the scope of a uh, little bit of the job description, I guess you might say, but uh, appreciate you bringing it forward. So, One of the things that I found interesting that Angie clued me into on Sunday, because I was under a misconception about affordable housing also, is that you could have a building that is affordable housing from one of these entities or whoever built it and whoever's overseeing it. And you could have one neighbor in a two bedroom apartment with three people or four people, and they would be paying, let's say a thousand dollars a month for that same, for that apartment. And their next door neighbor in exactly the same apartment might be paying 1500 a month because it is based on their income, which is what the definition of affordable, in, uh, affordable housing is. So when people are start talking about where there's going to be this, you know, low income housing and not in my backyard and that kind of thing, that's not what it's really all about. It's all about being able to put up a building that they can actually use for affordable housing and not every unit is going to bring in the same amount of money from the people living in it. But the subsidies that are done with the other government agencies and things like that are what make it work along before or after the fact of getting it built. That's yeah, and that's exactly true. And that's part of the reason why some of these dollars are slated to go towards operation and maintenance because it's not a uh, market rate apartment complex that is a, is for profit and that allows for the level of income to come in where you can you know put money aside for your 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 maintenance and and capital needs. Um, these buildings don't generate that type of income. They don't generate a profit. And so the 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 money for capital. Um, is great. You got to build the buildings, but then you also do need to have money for those maintenance issues and for the operations because the building itself won't generate that revenue. Sorry, I got um, kicked off there for a minute. My internet's kind of sketch. Uh, I just want to say I, I do like the idea of um, supporting this, but I would like to see, like Gary mentioned, some type of check-in sunset clause to make sure it's doing what we want to do with it. Um, but I understand there's entities that are doing this and um, we're partnering with people and doing that uh, makes it tough. I just, I, I would like to make sure that we're actually seeing the funds do what we want to do with them. Yeah, you know, one thing that the, the mental health uh, or the behavioral health sales tax board does is they, pro they provide a yearly um, assessment of how the dollars are being set, spent, how if the programs are meeting their benchmarks. Um, so so there, my, I guess my assumption is that a similar model would be followed for these dollars, but I, I think there's real benefit in transparency of how these dollars are benefiting our individual communities, especially because, you know, cities have the opportunity to, to pass this if the county doesn't. And so cities wanna know that their dollars are being used to help their citizens and help their community. Well, I know you can't identify it always right back to the city of Lake Stevens. Sure. Know that we're doing it for our communities, whether it's ours or the next community. Our people from our community are benefiting. We don't. I think we lost them again. Uh oh. But someone quick save that picture. <laughs> He'll be back. Hey, well, well, he comes back. I guess I have, I have a similar concern as Gary that there's not a sunset clause on this, and I think we all know that uh, there won't be because they're gonna they're gonna need to bond this money right to to do projects on the long term, and so you're not gonna see this end in five years or ten years. It's gonna be much further down the road. It's a concern I have. Well, in order to get a sunset in there, you'd have to go to the legislature and get them to change 1590 also. So because it's not in there, you know, we're not going to be able to say, well, put that in there and, we'll, and we're going to be good. We're either right. good or we're not. So and the other thing I want to make sure everybody knows is we're either good at supporting the letter going to the council, county council, or we're not. You know, we're that is giving our 
you know, yeah, we want to raise our taxes this much if you're going to use it for this, but the county council is going to make the ultimate decision. And they only have till December 30th, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's true. It was September 30th, but because of COVID, they extended it. Question on that on that point, Kim and, and Angie, um, has there been any conversation? Is there any indication if the county council would actually take action on this? Uh, if there were a letter of support. The county council is planning on bringing this up at their meeting. I think it's the first Tuesday of November. I'll have to go back and look at the date, um, but they have requested that municipalities submit letters by October 28th. So that they have those letters prior to their meeting. Okay. My suggestion, Kim, would be that uh, if we do a letter of support, that we offer a suggestion that this would be much more palatable to the, the voting public, that this have some sort of sunset to it rather than just a uh, perpetuity type thing. County can choose what to do with it if they, uh, as they wish, but I think it's important that um, as everybody's pointed out, we don't know what the future is going to bring here. Um, you know, case in point, King County Metro with their bus transportation ridership is down for, so what is the first thing they do? They ask for a tax increase to subsidize the buses. I mean, come on. Um, and I, I don't want to compare us directly to that, but there is this ongoing layering of effective taxes that increase over time. And you know, the bureaucracy that's built with that is is troubling because, um, you know, uh, sales tax, we're going to be hitting 10% here probably in the next five to 10 years. Uh, some municipalities are already there. We were at 7% a few years back, you know, it's, it's, it just continues. And, and to Council Member Dickinson's, Dickinson's point, we talk about people especially older seniors that have a fixed income and you know the the expenses continue for this need and for that need and it certainly makes it very difficult for those folks and they're not getting much raises for social security things of that sort so every dollar is very important to them and i think we need to we need to be mindful of that so hey, angie, angie so just a couple of questions. As, as you've talked about affordable housing and those sorts of things on, on these boards, you know, when I think of housing, I, when I think of what we're doing, trying to do with this sort of an idea is picking up people who've lost their housing or are going to lose their housing and putting them in other housing, right? So has there been any thought of how do we keep people in their houses? You know, I, I think of Mary's uh, example of senior citizens who can't afford to be here, right? Well, I would rather chip them another hundred bucks a month or whatever the, it is than move them into another, you know, $80 million worth of housing. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Or, I, oh, or, good. Or if, or if that, that one family is a, a little low on, on skills and they can't get that next level job, right? I'd rather the city bust them 500 bucks and go learn how to be a flagger or a cashier or, um, or, or get them some skills so that they go to that next level and stay in that house. Right. Absolutely. That's, those are the sorts of programs I would rather see us looking at other than raising more tax dollars to, um, to just go to more housing to shift people. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think you bring up a really good point and, and, looking at the analysis of our county, of Snohomish County, um, we have, there's, there are a continuum of support that families can be offered, right? So it could be, it could be um, eviction prevention dollars, you know, you pay someone's rent for one month and that's what they need to get ahead and stay ahead and, and not be facing eviction. Or just like you said, job training and employment services. Those are certainly services that um, also I think need, um, need attention and we need to make sure that those are robust as well. But the overall um, as assessment of our county is that we, Snohomish County does not have enough affordable housing units to meet today's need 
and to meet the anticipated need. And so, so I agree with everything that you said. I think we need to pay attention to all of those things. We need to make sure that there are um, available supports for, for all 50 different scenarios that can befall a family or an individual that can put them in a place where they're cost burdened. I think affordable housing development is one of those pieces of the puzzle. So, so as part of this conversation, just um, just keep in the back of your mind. You know, this this year we were going to talk and maybe and probably take to the voters a point two or a point one sales tax uh, uh, request from uh, the voters for a TBD. So, if we ask the county to tax us a point one on this, and then we want to do a TBD next year or whenever that might be, now we're you know, now we're at 0.3. Now we're going from the lowest, I think we're the lowest other than a couple of county places um, as far as sales tax revenue to now we're at, you know, 0.93 overall. So put that in your mind as well that every little point counts. For sure. Yeah, I agree. Any other questions I can try and answer? I am happy to go back to the um, program manager of the Alliance and suggest that language be added to the letter regarding um, a sunset clause. The draft letter is in your packet. I think it was in the packet last Tuesday. I think it's in tonight's packet as well. Um, that letter is being sent to all municipalities requesting that they sign and return to the County Council. And so, um, I will I'll kind of explore what the options are in terms of changing some of the wording or adding that clause um, or you know what the Alliance's thoughts are about having a sunset clause. And then um, does it make sense then to bring that information back to uh, council next Tuesday? Well, first off, Angie, I've never been a fan of just signing on to a form letter uh, that goes to everybody saying the same thing. Uh, we're we're an individual city with individual differences of opinion from some of our other neighbors. And I think that the way that Gary brought this forward would be something we would write the letter if we write a letter in support with a couple of caveats, whatever those are. Uh, and what that would be actually doing is telling the county council what our thought process is. That doesn't necessarily mean that Linwood or Monroe or anybody else is going to have that same thought process. So when we're talking to our county council as one of their constituents, then they need to know our thought process and not a form letter from that makes uh, or whoever. Sure. Kim, um, in the event that there is a letter of support along with uh, some sort of clause for uh, sunsetting, um, maybe we should consider uh, hearing what some of the concerns are ultimately uh, how these dollars get spent. Um, there, there may be some value in adding language that speaks to some level of oversight or transparency on how these dollars are being used or what those decision processes are that lead to the allocation of funds in advance of expenditures. I would agree with anything that we think is uh, appropriate for the way we feel about if you're going to raise our sales tax point or you know, one tenth of one percent, then this is what we think needs to be done. And that gives them the information of having them help make their decision uh, based on what our criteria is. Now, does that really hold weight with four of the other city councilmen or county councilmen? I don't know. Uh, but I believe it would hold weight with ours. And uh, I think that if we're going to send a letter with anything attached to it, we should tell them exactly how we feel. And if they're, because it doesn't really say that there's going to be, that the county has to do anything except spend 60% minimum on affordable housing units. And they have to look at these types of people that are gonna go into those units. That's the only thing it really says. It doesn't say how to do it, how to, how to prioritize it, how to do anything. And so I think we're well within our rights to say, if you're gonna do this, this is the way we want you to do it. 
right. and we and we can support it if you'll follow those kinds of things. Uh, in, in in all reality, we're kicking the can down the road to the county council to make a decision, and we're just sending in a letter of support saying, "Yeah, we we think we're okay with this, but hey, you need to think about this." So my question, Angie, would be: Do you see any problem with uh, the suggestions that are being sent your way? Um, as being a problem if we compose our own letter? Do you think that will? Yeah, I think that we, and it makes really can, good sense. I think I, okay, I, good. I really appreciate um, Kim's perspective and mm -hmm. that sense that, you know, signing a form letter doesn't necessarily communicate, you know, what, what we agree to as a city. And um, I'm, I'm supportive of moving in that direction. What, what then, so given the kind of the tight timeline, I guess I'm curious to know or to come up with what the next steps would be like to have a letter in place for review. It seems like for the packet this Friday in time to vote on it for the meeting next Tuesday. So Mr. Mayor, do you have somebody in the staff that could handle rewriting the letter? that would add some of the things that we've discussed, like what Gary and what Sean said? Yeah, I think, uh, Kelly, why don't you, um, can you partner up with uh, just notes and thoughts from this workshop and then maybe partner with, uh, well, partner with whoever wants to get some input in on it. Sure. And, um, and let's see if we can gin that up by Friday. Kelly, I'm happy to help. Just let me know what you need. Okay, thank you, is Angie. That, is that doable, Kelly, for you? I think so, yeah. Yeah, cool. I've got good people around me. We'll figure you it out. Great people around you. Yes. You have courageous people. <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you all for your for your time and your questions and your willingness to um, to really kind of understand this and help support this moving forward in a way that makes sense for our city. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I'd just like to thank Kim and especially Angie. Great depth of knowledge on the subject. It was, it was a good discussion and uh, one to have. Uh, good start. So let's move on to 2021 preliminary budget, Josh and Barb. All right. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Let me share my screen here. There we go. You can everyone see that? Okay. Um, that was a good discussion and I hopefully you guys can carry this forward and talk about some uh, budget issues that we need to talk about and get some council direction on. So continue with all the great questions and, and I would be very happy. So we're just gonna talk about a few items today, not that many just kind of some topics that we need to get some direction on as we go forward in the budget process. Uh, here we are today on the 20th. Um, here's the schedule and we'll talk about the schedule. We, maybe we can um, get rid of a few of these meetings if we don't need them. Um, but going out in uh, public hearing on the 10th and budget public hearing on the 24th and, and then hopefully that'll be it. So there's not too much left in the budget process. So the first topic we need to talk about is something that's pretty uncommon this year and it's property taxes and the limit to property taxes. Uh, so in, in a normal year, typically it's 1%. We can increase our property tax by 1%. And that the language in the RCW is actually, it's the lesser of the IPD or 1%. But usually the, one, the IPD or the implicit price deflator is more than 1%. So that's why we're limited to 1% or what we call a limit factor of 101%. 1% of last year's highest lawful levy. Our highest lawful levy is what we have right now. We don't have any bank capacity. So our highest lawful levy is a levy that we do every single year. So normally you get one more percent on top of that. This year, and I have a little graph here I stole from MRIC, we are less than 1%. So because our population is greater than 10,000, we can't just levy 1% like we normally do. We're actually limited to 100.6%. We're limited to the lesser of the 1% or the IPD. And it's kind of interesting. You can look at this graph 
you can look back during the past recessions and then especially back in 2009 where it was actually negative. So if you didn't make any decisions, you actually had to decrease your property taxes. So that was a kind of interesting year. But what this means is if we don't do anything, we are limited, but there is something we can do. You can exceed the limit by doing a substantial need ordinance. And so what does this mean? If we do nothing, we just we can either levy between 0% and 0.6%. So if we don't do anything, we just lose that capacity. We lose that 0.39%. Uh, so you, you lose that value. You can't bank that value. It just goes away. Um, but you can go above and beyond that if you do an ordinance substantial need. And that's what we need to talk about a little bit is if we want to do that. Um, if you do that, you can go up to 1%. Uh, you can let, once you do the ordinance of substantial need, you can go up to 1% and then that allows you to do whatever you want. So now you're not limited to 0.6, you're limited to 1% and you can go from zero to 1% now instead of between zero and 0.6%. So it just gives you the option to go to one and now you can bank whatever you want up to 1% or you can levy up to 1%. So it's not super complex. It doesn't happen very often, but it's something, it's an additional ordinance that the council has to do. They have to do an ordinance to get to the 1% limit. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Does that um, ordinance of substantial need also allow you to bank a portion of the 1%? So it's basically like you, you can always bank. So even if you did nothing, you could bank the 0. 0.6. You could say, I'm going to levy zero. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bank 0.6. If you do a substantial need, now you go up to 1%. Now you can bank all the way up to 1%. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. Yeah. And so what's interesting is if you don't do that, you can't bank that 20,000 at all. It just goes away. Got it. Thanks. So Josh, why don't you explain, unless you're going to in the next slide, what substantial needs are allowed? Actually, um, it's just an... I guess I didn't really look into that, but I mean, the last one we did, an ordinance of substantial need just says, yes, the city could use it. You know, our operating expenses are, are greater than our revenues. I mean, we have we have a substantial need case to do 1%. Um, but from what I, the last time I looked at, I'm sorry I didn't look at this, but anybody can just say they have substantial need. I don't think there's a lot of uh, special language or special like, your finances have to look a certain way to get it. Um, but I would have to double check on that, Daughtry. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But I could have swore the last time we did this, we had a statement that we made for the substantial need. And I think it, I think it was a qualifying statement. I might be wrong on that. But I seem yeah. to remember something like that. I skimmed it, but I did not read it. I'll have to go back and look. For, for what I remember, it's just it's like a, it's just like a, a series of steps you have to go through to get. To get there's back. no, um, there's no bright line or there's yeah. no specific description that has to be given, <clears throat> but the ordinances for substantial need will commonly justify and make a justifying statement. And then there's a requirement of <clears throat> a majority plus one to mm -hmm. approve the ordinance. I, I think, okay, thank you. I think what we do for a substantial need, we just say, we provide public safety, we provide, you know, infrastructure, you just say that we want to continue providing those services. And that is the substantial need. Okay, so here, I just wanted to show the difference between like what a 1% would look like in the 0.6%. Uh, we always get new construction. We always get annexations. We always get the state assessed and the refunds. So the difference really is the uh, the column B there. And the difference between the two is well, it's just a little over 20,000. So that's the main discussion here. Um, it's always recommended to do the substantial need, even if you guys decide to levy less than 1%, because then we can bank it. If we don't do the substantial need, you can't even bank the capacity. And what that means is we could bank it and then we could ask for more than 1% in, in a different year. Um, so it's definitely to the benefit to do substantial need, 
even just to bank the difference. But if you want to go all the way to 1%, you have to do the ordinance of substantial need. You can see that 1% for the Lake Stevens is really not that much, 50,000. I mean, we spend that 10 different ways already in the budget. So, but that's what a 1% looks like versus the 0.6. Um, just a little comparison, the, the city's AV went up by about 8% this year. So I just kind of showed us some examples of a house from 2020 and a house in 2021. If they went up by about the same percentage as the city's AV overall, this is what a 1% in property tax looks like and what 0.6% looks like and the difference between the two. If your AV increases less than this, then you're, it's less. And if it increases more than this, then it's more. So it's just relative on how much your house goes up in value. So, I mean, we're talking, it's a pretty small difference. Here's just another graph that I like to show that just shows that we're just a small piece of property taxes, right? So here's an example of 2020, your house is worth 350,000 at last year's levy rate, that's your taxes. If that house were to increase by 8% this year, your taxes would be $18, a little over $18 more than last year. But still, we're still just a small piece of the total property taxes that you pay. So what do we need to do? What decisions do we need to make? Um, if we do nothing, then we can still levy between zero and 0.6. We just lose that 0.398%. We can't bank it, we can't use it. Uh, you can declare substantial need and we can levy the full 1% or we can uh, declare substantial need and we can levy between 0 and 1% and you can bank anything that you don't take up that's 1% less whatever you could take. Um, I make a little math note. I say math note here, compounding of levies. Uh, I've done some math behind the compounding and what I mean by that is if you take 1% every year, you get 1% this year, and then you get that 1% next year too. And you get that same 1% every year compounding all the way out in the future. So 1% you know, isn't very much when you spread it across a whole city, but it actually does have some compounding effect when you keep doing those 1% and they keep compounding over time. Uh, so I always like to make a note about the compounding of levies and the, the effect in the long term. So, um, the next discussion after this, we're going to talk about TBDs for a little bit, but I wanted to stop here and just get kind of the council's feeling as I put the property tax um, presentation for the public hearing together, kind of what direction you guys are thinking. Nobody? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Good grief. Everybody, you guys got to start talking. I'm the only one that talks. Okay, Kim, I'll interrupt you. Okay, good. <laughs> um, this year, I am inclined, because of everything that's going on, I am more inclined to go ahead and do a substantial need to the 1%, but then only levy the 0.602% and bank the rest. That's what I'm inclined to do. Okay. I would. I agree. Sorry, Gary, I jumped in ahead of you, but I agree. No, that's fine, Mary. I agree with Kim's statement and your statement as well, too. So, I'm supportive of moving in that direction as well. Okay. That was the easy one. <laughs> so, what this means is just when we go to talk about. Um, the public hearing, there'll just be two ordinances. One will be a substantial need ordinance. The second one will be our actual ordinance, the levy 0.6 instead of 1%. Okay. Any other discussion on that? Okay. I will put that together for 0.6%. Sean, Sean, are you there? Because you look like you might be. Oh, you are. Okay, you're moving. Good. I'm here. I thought you might be frozen, and we hadn't heard from you. So, is there? I know I don't really have a majority council. Is there another? Is there head nods on that same direction from everybody? Yes, I, I fully support the opinions that have already been expressed. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the next topic is TBD and the mayor talked about this a little bit. And I think you guys had a retreat. You guys talked about TBD, the transportation benefit district. So I just put some slides kind of repeated from the retreat, just an overview um, that it's been established and it just doesn't have a funding mechanism. The funding mechanism um, is, well, up until a few days ago, it was sales tax, um, but then the tabs got overturned. So I had actually eliminated everything that talks about tabs in here. So I'm gonna talk about sales tax, but just know that the tab option is probably back on the table. And so we can talk about that a little bit if we want to. But the TBD is just another way to fund transportation projects, just like my presentation last time, it takes a lot of different funding sources to maintain and do road projects, um, all of these. And then the TBD would just be another, you know, funding source or something in the tool belt to get projects done. This is just a slide that kind of reiterates that from my last presentation. Every project we do, it takes a little bit of everything to get it done. Um, so the TBD is just another helpful tool as the city grows and costs increase that um, projects just get more expensive. And this allows the city to have a continuing funding source along with, re, along with mitigation to continue to um, do those projects. The, um, so this talks about sales tax. The sales tax option has to go to vote. You can do up to two tenths. So you can do one tenth or two tenths. Uh, it does not last forever. So you have to be every 10 years, you have to vote for it. Um, at the bottom here, I have an estimated at what the two tenths is. So one tenth would just be half of that. This does not estimate like, you know, future large developments. I don't have anything about that, but it would just be more if we've got large commercial developments. Um, the, the collection is depending on when we pass it. So there's, I have another slide here that talks about that. Uh, this was just a cool slide that Mr. Spencer made. So I thought I would give him props about that, but it just talks about that there's immediate and direct benefits. There's projects that we can't get to that this funding can help with. They can help with large projects, can help maintain our rows, overlays, crack ceiling. So it's a very versatile funding source that you can use. So, if we were to go forward with it, this is just kind of uh, the future measures that we would have to be on. And if you're on a special election, obviously it's more expensive. Um, I put the February one on here, but that's probably a tough one. But this kind of tells you about the, um, the, the lag time between a measure being passed and when you would receive your actual payments because there's a, a delay for when the Department of Revenue actually starts letting you collect it. And then you have another two month delay before you receive that first payment. So up here are just um, the three, the, the next, the February one, the next year after that, and then the November election. I think there's one in between the two, but I didn't have time to update my, my presentation. But you can see the lag time. Like if we were to put something on the, um, in April, we wouldn't even start collecting it until January of 2022. And we wouldn't receive our first payment until March of 2022. Um, so you guys have talked a lot about TBDs. And so this is just another question to the council on if we should think we should budget for putting something on the ballot for a TBD. And if we would wanna do a sales tax, um, I mean, Brett, maybe Brett can chime in. I know he's, not in favor of the tabs, but tabs do not have to go to public vote. Um, so I'll leave that up to the mayor to talk about that a little bit. But other than that, just in general, uh, talking about the TBD and what, how we want to go forward. Yeah, and what I the reason why I asked Josh to, to cover this tonight is just to refresh everyone's memory on it. And is this something that it's on the pallet uh, to maybe re-engage over this next year. Uh, I know we, we were going to look at doing it, uh, doing a vote for it um, this November, and then COVID changed some things. So um, I just wanted to re-engage everyone on this, see where their, their thoughts were 
on if we wanted to shoot for something like this over this next year to put it in front of the voters. This is um, super helpful. Thank you, uh, Josh, for the information. Mm -hmm. I um, continue to be supportive of moving in this direction. It's hard to stomach spending $70,000 to get it on the ballot. And I realize the timing then means if we wait until the general next November, um, you know, we've got a year and a half before we have any revenue. But that's sort of where I'm, I'm feeling kind of stuck. Um, hey, Josh, did that, um, could we not put it on the primary that would be in? Yeah, I think that's the one that I missed. There was, there's one more in between there, in between the April and November. I think it's in August. Yeah. Do you remember the, the, the cost to the city to put something on the primary ballot? Um, I, feel like it was, I, I feel like it was quite a bit less than the February so, ballots, but it wasn't zero. Is that seem accurate uh, yeah the reason mr. why mayor. the the like november is oh sorry go ahead i was going to say mr mayor didn't we do a little research regarding the the seventy thousand? is if it's a single issue uh yeah. measure if there's more items on there then uh, yeah, yeah the cost decreases okay. i believe the um primary is about thirty five thousand, but the fact that we have uh, measures already going to um, ballot uh, in 2021, we have a number of council members um, that will already be on the ballot, then it actually, um, well, I guess that's the question. If there's a number of um, um, council members opposed to where there has to be a primary, then it will be basically um, no charge, no additional charge on top of that. But uh, they generally figure it's about 35,000. It's about half of that of a special election. Thanks, Mark. One of the things we talked about, and I don't remember if we talked about this at the uh, retreat or not, I don't remember when, <clears throat> but we were uh, discussing this to go to um, sales tax for the reason of first off we get more and it spreads it to other people that come in and use our community uh, other than just Lake Stevens residents uh, getting hit with this tax. And that's one of the reasons we went away from the tabs <clears throat> uh, along with the reason that we didn't know what the tabs were going to be doing and that changed last week. Um, the other thing that I want us to remember is we had decided way back when, when we first started talking about this, that we would actually put a list of projects together that would be a part of the package to our residents to tell them this is what we're going to do so they could see where that money was going and could watch it. And I don't wanna lose sight of that. I mean, I understand we could bolster uh, a project that's coming up but I think we really do need to say, no, these are the projects that the TBD is going to be used for just as, because the council is responsible for this TBD now because we have passed that part already. Uh, if it would have been a different uh, bunch of people watching the TBD, then they would have had to have those kinds of things that they were watching and we need to do the same thing. Yeah. I think absolutely. I would agree with your comments, 110%, Mr. Daughtry. Me too. Okay, well, let's, um, you know, let's just put this in our thought, uh, in our thoughts, and maybe we re-engage this at our retreat uh, whenever we do that, January or February, and then, um, and then if it's something that we want to engage and then have that discussion of, of when we would put it on the ballot. Could we also maybe uh, instruct the public works director to maybe come up with a list of some things that would likely be, I guess, kind of quote needs in the immediate future? Yeah, so you've said it, so it is done. I. I could add a couple things. We have put together this rough list of projects. And if you look at TBDs across the state, a large portion of the TBD are used to fund maintenance and operations type of 
projects, not so much capital projects since the dollar amount is so low. We could put some capital projects in there. Uh, Grace and I had met with the company today. You know, we proposed in our budget pavement preservation to go from four to 500,000 in 2021. Part of that was to redo this, uh, what we've all talked about is this pavement ranking condition index since one hasn't been done since 2016. The company that we discussed or talked to today was really cool. Council member Peter Shagan, I remember you and I having this discussion about deferred maintenance and pavement condition and how much would we have to invest into our roads so we're not declining condition faster than we can repair them. And that was some of the data we talked to them about today, which we could get, which would be really cool to see. Okay, currently we invest $400,000 a year in overlays, but still by 2030, we're going to be in complete failure of all our streets. What is that target number a year to where we can stay even status quo? And, you know, we've thrown out a number of you know, millions of dollars each year. I think when we had this discussion, it was from, from the math that I did off of the last study in 2016 was like $2 million a year, still not climbing us out of the hole as far as the condition goes. So I, I think it's great to start discussing this again next year. That'll give Grace and I the time to get this other pavement condition ranking done and, and be able to come back to council and the public with concrete data to show the condition of our roads. And part of that is a sidewalk condition rating and connection of where the pieces aren't. You know, since last council meeting, we've had so many calls about crosswalks now. And, and uh, <laughs> since, since the last discussion, we probably had 20 public works requests to where now we've had to create an Excel spreadsheet just to track them all to uh, somehow get back to these people. And those are some of the maintenance projects that a TBD could help fund, not so much major capital, but taking care of some of these citizen concerns of being able to add crosswalks and, and fixing some sidewalk connections and making our streets safer and, and trying to pay for some of the deferred maintenance that we're seeing take its toll on our, on our roads. So uh, I, I love the discussion. I love where it's going. I, I think next year, even November is not an unrealistic time frame. By the time we get all this information together and, and are able to come back to the public with concrete data and, and information of what they'll actually be buying and, and what we can give the taxpayers for the money they're spending. So just my two cents. So it sounds to me like it's more for preservation because it, you're only talking less than a million dollars coming in from this. That would help. It would help in just preservation if we just said the TPD was only for that. That's almost what it sounds like you're saying, Eric. Uh, on the other issue that you brought up, I can't understand why you don't put the young lady in charge of that Excel spreadsheet that brought this whole thing, <laughs> uh, whole thing to us. So, well, that's just an example, Councilmember Daughtry, of what other cities do. You look at their websites. A lot of that money is tailored towards pre pavement preservation projects uh, and some capital. I think a lot of cities have the same ideas that, that we're having that, yes, we want to be able to allocate a certain amount of this to capital to provide leverage money for grants and, and other smaller projects. So that's certainly something that, that council could set up that we're going to do, you know, 80% preservation and 20 capital or, or vice versa, however the city would choose to set it up. But uh, I, I will need a little bit more time, Grace and I, to be able to come back with hard data. We, we haven't been able to do that. It is in the budget for next year if it gets approved to do that new condition ranking. Also, we shared 2016 data with which makes us nice. We've shared the 2016 data with this company to where you can see what that depreciation rate has been over the last five years. So you can make some predictions in the next five years. I, I'm really excited about 
the data that's coming forward, because that's what I think we've all been looking for all along is, is what is that number, right? Council member Peter Shagan of, of deferred maintenance and, and what would it actually take in a perfect world to turn the frown upside down, so to speak, because right now our roads are failing quicker than we can fix them. And at some point you're gonna hit rock bottom and you're gonna have all your condition ratings below a 70 or 80 on the PCI number. And that's not where we wanna be in Lake Stevens. I know that. So uh, if we could, could at least be investing and covering depreciation would be a, a fairly decent pavement preservation plan. Can I just say something about having walked two thirds of this city everywhere? I can tell you that if we can make it safer for people to walk here, it's not splashy like a capital improvements, but it is something that's much needed. And I think people will believe uh, that that is a worthy way to go with this transportation benefit district. Uh, I really know we need that badly. And I, just to think of what's going on on our roads right now, uh, Eric, and how hard you work to try to make it safe for people to drive I think it's it's really worthy. I really do. So I, know. I have no problem with that. Just the complaints and the requests and stuff that come into my office, uh, none of them are for major capital projects. They're all for sidewalk connectivity, crosswalks, make exactly what you're saying, Council Member Dickinson. It's making things safer, more walkable for the community. I don't think I've seen, hey, we need a you know, widen 20th. No. <laughs> Those are rare. It's it's the things that mean a lot to people, and I think you'd gain a lot more support tailored towards those types of issues than, you know. Plus, you can spread it out over the whole community, right? You can make meaningful improvements in all areas of the community versus, you know, people in the north end. Well, we're paying for twentieth, and we never drive it. Or, right. Exactly. It'd be nice if, if people are paying that you're making meaningful improvements in all areas of the city. I know. The west end, southwest end of the city has been kind of ignored since we have next it. And not a lot of improvements have happened other than 20th Street. So, you know, what, what can we do for meeting for projects in all areas of the city to make it better for all the residents would be my goal. One of the other things I think needs to be reiterated here is that if we, that we need to do a transportation benefit district for one other reason other than the preservation or capital projects that we can do, and that is because the legislature has given us a tool to use to raise funds. And if we don't use all the tools they give us, they're not going to even contemplate other tools to give us to use uh, in the future. As some of the things that we've been trying to do is tax increment financing or something like that. And they are not uh, forthcoming in those kinds of things if you don't use the tools that we have been given. Uh, so I'm for doing this. I just don't know what it looks like yet. Agreed. All right, well, let's uh, table that discussion and we'll pick it back up on our next uh, council retreat. And on the meantime, we'll work on some project ideas and, and kind of formulate what the package looks like. All right, let's, uh, uh, Josh, you're still up, right? Yep, this is the last one here. Uh, the, this is just the funding of organizations. Uh, three up here talk about for funding, Snohomish Health District, Senior Center, and the, the mayor wanted me to put the Economic Alliance of Snohomish County up here. So just the health district just spoke, so that's good. Um, currently we're $1 per thousand. We haven't budgeted for 2020 and for 2021. So discussion is if we want to continue. Senior Center's up here. Uh, they received some funding in 2019, nothing for 2020 except for the CARES Act money, and we don't have anything budgeted for them for 2021. And then the Economic Alliance, we uh, do $3,000 per year. So the discussion is just about these three organizations. Uh, yes. Um, I, I believe the... Um, it, for the health district, it's actually one dollar per capita, or per per person, not per thousand. Per person. Oh, per person. Oh, sorry, that was my fault. I was in property tax world. You're right. <laughs> yeah. So one dollar per person, my fault. And then two dollars per person is what they were requesting. 
for a long time. And I'm sorry, are we we're deciding this now? It's no, just kind of discussion about it. Discussion. Okay. I mean, I um, health district discussion is every year. We talk about right. if we want to leave the money there. We have, think we can do better in our community. The senior center, I think, is just. I don't want to speak for other people, but we've been trying to give them help and money, and they just don't seem to be utilizing the city. And so, there's just discussion about the senior center, and then the mayor will have to speak about <laughs> economic alliance a little bit, but. Yeah. Uh, if we're receiving our, our money's worth is what the question is. Okay, can I speak up on the senior center? Sure. Um, it's my understanding that they did complete all the paperwork uh, in order to get some support. Um, and I, it, every time I talk about this, it sounds like the 20K that was given to them twice, thank you very much, is probably not going to happen again. But they do have and I have told the treasurer of the senior center to speak at the next meeting about this. They have a, a need for $5,000 so that they can have their workable uh, bus that they will wanna use. So when they get around, there are specific needs and, and they were told they hadn't filled out the paperwork requesting support and uh, that was not correct. So I'm wondering if, if the communication is as clear as it should be um, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just the liaison, so I can't answer any questions, but I just was wondering, and I know I've talked to Barb about this before and Brett about this before and whoever else. Um, so uh, rather than take them completely off our radar, um, I don't, it says it's not budgeted for 2021. And I'm wondering if that's a done deal. Did I hear you say that this is for their bus? Well, they need money for their bus. They have a bus, but they have to get all the uh, paperwork and the insurance and so forth. So the safe. No, I think I think they've got that taken care of now. Okay. Uh, I mean, I guess I know I see Jerry waving yes at us, but uh, I know he can't talk. But um, I'm pretty sure that they've got the bus operational and they've got everything they need for that. Okay. So if there's going to be a request from the senior center, I think then they would need to come and tell us what they want to use the money for. I'm not against giving money to the senior center and not at all, but I'd like to know what they want it for and you know how can we help if we're going to help. Now that's still a council decision. I'm just saying right. where I stand on that. Right. I would also like to talk about the Economic Alliance Snohomish County for just a second. One of the things that we pay for uh, that $3,000 a year is for them to help us in our economic development, which is what they're all about. If we have not used them for that, shame on us. Um, and so I still think we should have our membership with the ASC and use that membership the way it's meant to be used. Uh, I think it might be easier now with a full-time mayor to do that. Um, because they've got a lot of resources that could help us in our economic development. and We just need to turn around and use that. The other thing that that allows us to do is allows us, our council people and some of our staff to be able to go to some of the uh, things that EASC hosts every year. There's still a fee, I think, attached to some of it, but it's a reduced fee because we're members. I would like to speak to the health district funding. Um, I would like to propose that at minimum, we continue funding the health district at $1 per person per year. So 34, five for 2021. Um, I would be really interested in um, a discussion around, I think the in a discussion around what is happening throughout the county, especially in light of our global pandemic and the fabulous work of the health district this last year um, to see if other cities are considering increasing um, and looking at the possibility of increasing that incrementally over the next several years, um, maybe by 25 cents a year so that we're fully funding them at $2 per person per year. But I think at minimum we should definitely continue the $1 per year. I agree. 
Hey, hey Kim, the uh, ESC discussion came up between mayors on whether or not um, some of them are were going to partially fund or or pull out completely because they didn't feel they were getting um, bang for buck currently. Uh, currently, and that's why I put that up there to have this discussion and see how we felt on this. Well, I want to get our bang for the buck, but I I think it's. <clears throat> I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're getting our bang for the buck. If we're not asking them for help or asking them for opinions on uh, what's going on with the economic development in the area, uh, showing them what we have available and having them help us find the people to come into that economic development, then we're wasting a resource, not to mention the $3,000 a year. Um, it's the same conversation that we have for, with chamber members. I mean, why do they want to be a chamber member if you're not going to come to the meetings or get togethers or whatever, you're not using the resources of the chamber, then yeah, why would you spend your $190 or whatever to be a chamber member? It's the same, it's the same thing, just a different organization. And so I, I can understand, and there's the same conversation we had uh, a couple of years ago about the health district. You know, what's our bang for a buck? What are they doing for us? And it really revolved around back then with, well, you guys aren't giving us the data that we requested. Okay, we went through all that. That's ancient history. Uh, but it really is, no, it's a community thing with the health district. It's not what they can do for Lake Stevens. What are they doing for the entire community where they have, where they put their resources to help everybody? It's a regional thing and or a countywide thing anyway, in this case. And so I've never had a problem with that one. Um, I think that it's the wrong thought process to ask the ASC, what are you doing for us when we're not asking? Now, I don't know that we're not asking. Maybe you and John uh, have asked for information or help from the ASC and we didn't get it. That's a different, that's a different take on it, if that's correct. Uh, I am involved with the ASC, with the Snohomish County um, Committee for Improved Transportation. And we get a lot from them on that. Now, we're just kind of an ancillary committee to EASC, but we get a lot of bang for being with SKIT. Now, it is an extra piece of money that we that we char are charged for SKIT. And only ESC, the only thing they're doing is administrative assistance for them. But it's basically in the same group. And so we get our we get, we, all, we probably get our three thousand dollars a year for EASC just from Skit. Kim, is there um, regarding the economic alliance? There's no reason why we can't sit on that board, correct? It's a matter of we're not attending, right? Uh, I don't know. The board is different in that regard. Uh, we can get on the board. Right. If they have if they have board uh, vacancies, we can certainly get on the board. But it isn't that just because you're a member, you sit on the board. And they have several boards, um, so I I I can't actually answer your question about that. It isn't just because you're a paying member. There's a seat at the board. I do know that. Hmm. I I mean I economic allowance is going through a little bit of a tough time right now, I guess, is yeah, with, that's correct. With, yep. uh, <laughs> change in leadership and so forth. I don't know as though they've actually found somebody yet. Um, they did have a fairly dynamic leader that was, you know, had certainly pushed it forward from where it had been a number of years ago. My hope is that they do the same again soon. COVID has certainly knocked the wind out of the sails on that. But I would say, you know, in light of what we're going through economically and so forth, I don't know as if it would be a wise decision to um, disassociate ourselves with them. Uh, we're going to need all the help we can get here in the next few years, I think. Um, and so I would encourage that we stay involved with that group. And as Councilmember Daughtry discussed, we we need to step forward and and be at the table a little bit more, I think, uh, me included. 
and um, not pointing a finger at anybody, but I'm just saying th there's an opportunity there that we could probably take advantage of. And I think we should be doing that. Regarding the senior center, um, my involvement in the council, that this has kind of been a volleyball issue in the sense one year we do something, next year we don't, and the next year we do something, and the next year we don't. Um, maybe if you could give me a little bit of guidance uh, we provide the facility. Is that correct? If somebody can answer that. And I guess I'm wondering what kind of value is in providing that facility. And then um, regarding the health district, I would concur with uh, Councilmember Jorstad um, that we continue 2021 uh, at the 34-5. Those are my thoughts. So, so to answer your senior center question, yes, we do provide that facility for you. Is there an established value for that um, in-kind provision, I guess? Uh, I, I don't know that we've asked that question. I don't know. I believe it was in their uh, contract what the in-kind was on that. Okay. I think it was discussed many years ago when we first put them in there. And then when we had the issue, I don't know how long ago, two, three years ago, when we didn't give them any money, uh, the conversation happened again uh, with uh, now ex-council member uh, leading that discussion. Um, I think that the intrinsic value of that, if intrinsic is the right word, I might be grasping at the English language here, uh, is that our seniors uh, that are struggling have a place to get a couple of meals a week and, and that kind of thing. I think it's a, a value to our community, uh, no matter what uh, it really is going on it, um, monetarily. Um, I, but I still hold that we need to know what they need the money for and decide if we want to fund that or if we need to go someplace else. There's a lot of different resources that they can go out to, including uh, members and non-members and businessmen. And, you know, I, I uh, give money to them every year for business, et cetera. So there's a lot of different things they do, but I would certainly not shy away from uh, helping them in some endeavor that they're after. Uh, one of the things we know is that they're too, the building's too small for them now, and it's only going to get worse. It, it can't get any better. The building's not going to grow. Uh, so they're going to be looking into the future to build another facility. They're going to have to. Uh, what that looks like is in the future. Just And, and I'm not saying all that just because I'm a senior citizen either. <laughs> I think there's been a lot of uh, feeling that um, seniors are not able to reach out to people. They are isolated. Uh, and when they go to the senior center, it's it's a life changer for them. So uh, I look forward to hearing what uh, Jerry Stombaugh has to say at our next meeting. He will clarify a lot, I'm sure. I just wanted to comment on the uh, economic alliance uh, issue. Um, I, I think that Kim uh, probably framed this right. It's it's the kind of organization that's kind of built for us to get the benefit out of it. We have to be reaching out to it. And I, I think to some extent there is, um, there's probably some value in reaching out sooner than later. I, re I recognize that they are going through some leadership changes. Uh, certainly uh, no, no stranger to the adversity that that creates. Um, however, I know, at least I believe, that they are um, either very early, uh, very early in the process of, of uh, going through some economic recovery uh, planning for the region. Uh, so some of, if there is value, if there's to be an ROI on the $3,000 investment, I think that uh, that might be um, able to be determined uh, relatively quickly by seeing the 
uh, direction and nature of those plans. Okay. Well, I think I've got the direction I need, unless anyone has anything else. We'll go to my last slide here. Uh, so the last one here is just to wrap it up with any priorities that council members haven't talked about and want to talk about. And then also, uh, we the stuff I presented, uh, the staff positions and the item requests and the capital, uh, not much questions. And so my question is, do we need any more budget discussions um, for these next couple council meetings? And it would basically, the next one would be, I'd put the budget together and get everything together and it would go, the next one would be a public hearing. Uh, I'll go first. Um, if, if you feel that you have all of the uh, input, yes, I, I wanted to uh, take the heat off of uh, Kim there for a second. Uh, he, he's kind of gone first in most of these issues. Josh, if you, if you and Barb already have all of the feedback you need from us, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily, I, I can't pinpoint the issue that I would say I want to come back next week and, and talk about this specific budget item again. Uh, obviously, I defer to uh, all of my colleagues on the, uh, on the on the council, and I'll just open that up with uh, those comments. I have to agree with Sean um, that we've discussed these things, and I believe that you and Barb have done an amazing job of clarifying what's needed, and I am ready to move forward and let the public speak. <laughs> okay. It might be an outlier, but it's just because it takes me some time to kind of process. And I think because I'm new, this is all really new information. I would love an opportunity for one final sort of summary or like, I think just summary and just to kind of go through the decisions that we've made. I'm also like, you know, I'm not, I'm not stuck on that. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll follow the majority um, of, well, of my colleagues. I would say too, I said I was going to put binders together and I am, but I kind of wanted to wait for a few of these. So I will be putting some budget binders together so I can give to everybody um, even before the public hearings. And so that could be a refresher. Um, and public, the public hearings are like, basically we go through all the decisions and then you open it to public comment and then you don't even have to make a decision that night. It goes to another, another meeting. So the public hearing meeting is like another, uh, to step through all the decisions that we've made up to that point too. Great. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I we love the like, idea of having a binder. <laughs> Appreciate just it. like you guys all to be kind of close to the same page by the time we get to uh, public hearings. We want to make sure we've actually addressed all of your concerns before we get there. And um, so if there's anything that we haven't discussed that you guys have been thinking about that we should have discussed, kind of this is the time to go through that is through the workshop so that we don't get caught off guard and we can give you the information you need in order to make the decisions that you need to make for next year's budget yeah that makes perfect sense thank you for the record i don't have anything that i'm like stuck on it's just more wanting to make sure that i understand the full picture and um feel comfortable moving forward so i think the binder and the public hearing would meet that need thank you okay so for the record i am stuck on something uh, but I would defer to my colleagues on whether we have another of these discussions before we go into public com uh, public uh, process. I could just get a hold with uh, or get a time with the mayor and go through mine. And what it is about is I got a little confused over the new staffing that we were going to do. Um, I looked at it again, and for some reason, I'm missing something. And I don't even know what it is, so it's really hard to explain, and that's why I don't want to bring it up in, in uh, this kind of thing, because I think it's just me, and it isn't anything else, and I I think that uh, the mayor could probably explain it to me rather well, so I'll just reach out to you, Brett, and uh, see if I can uh, better talk about where my issue is, so I'll try to get a hold of you in a couple of days. You got my number. <laughs> Hearing. 
Hey, let's move on because we're getting late on this. Um, Josh, anything else parting shots? I said, I think I've got everything I need and um, we'll get everything together. All right, Josh. Nice job, Great. Josh. Thanks. Very good job. And Barb. All right, Russ, you're up. Okay, I can make this um, extremely brief. Um, we'd gone through the, the budget discussions. In the budget discussions, council has seen the requests for equipment as well as for uh, personnel. Um, the inspection team, which includes um, two members of my staff, one member of Eric's staff, will need um, new vehicles going next year. And as you've heard about um, with the police, there's quite a lag time in getting vehicles ordered. So just wanted to bring this forward. I'd like to bring an action item at your next meeting that you just approve us to start the ordering process in 2020 for vehicles that would be delivered in 2021. And the approximate cost is $100,000. And we have all of those revenues in our permit fund to pay for those vehicles. Yeah, this is nothing new. We've done this quite a few years in a row. And I think it's a good thing to do. Absolutely agree. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we'll bring that forward as a consent agenda, um, consent agenda item at your next meeting. Yeah, thanks, Russ. And real quick, I got one more thing for the group. Um, so November 3rd, is we are slated for another workshop. Uh, that is obviously an evening of festivities in our country. How those festivities will, will um, show themselves, I don't know. But uh, so the question for you all is if we want to do a workshop that night or not, or if we do do one earlier or just don't do one. I would love to not have a workshop that night. I know Marcus told me welcome, earlier. Welcome back, you. Marcus. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, then we will take that workshop off the calendar. Perfect. I'm um, calling every last one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I don't want to keep anybody up, especially myself. And um, thanks, everyone. Uh, great discussion tonight. Um, this is what I enjoy about city government is uh, vast uh, differing good perspectives uh, and coming together as a team. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good night.